Some people say that soft chambers don't work at all. Others claim they do exactly the same thing that hard chambers are capable of. The truth is neither one of those statements is actually correct. Soft chambers and hard chambers are obviously not the same, but that doesn't mean that one is good and the other is useless. In some areas, they're working very similarly, but in other areas, their impact is vastly different. Emerging research is starting to clarify what we thought we knew about soft versus hard chambers. Some of those assumptions were correct, but a lot of them were flat out wrong. Today, we're gonna to set that record straight. In this video, I'll explain the differences between soft and hard chambers, what it appears that each one can or cannot do, and help you decide which one is right for you. I'm Dr. Jason Saunders, and with more than 20 years in this field, I've helped thousands of patients in my clinic, and I've also trained and certified over 600 different practitioners and technicians in 300 clinics all over the world. If you're running a clinic or wanting to get into hyperbarics and you're interested in additional learning, training, and certification, I'll put a link in the description below so that you can check out all the different trainings and certification programs that we offer. Long before I even entered this industry, the debate between soft and hard chambers has caused confusion for patients and practitioners and has really plagued us from being able to move forward with clarity and confidence. With a quick search online, you will see misinformation on both sides of the extremes. Soft chambers do nothing, hard chambers are the only things that work, or the opposite. Soft chambers could do anything a hard chamber can do, so it doesn't even matter which one you use. It's probably the most common question I get on this channel or in the teachings that I do, and clarity is important because making safe and effective decisions around patient care should be our number one concern. Now, when we're talking about the soft versus hard chamber, what we're actually alluding to is the material that the chambers are made out of, which is actually completely irrelevant. In other words, just because one material is soft and the other material is hard, that's not what makes the soft chamber and hard chamber debate important. What makes that debate important is the amount of pressure. And so soft chambers, which are considered mild hyperbaric chambers, typically operate at just a lower, more mild pressure, which is 1.3 ATA or 1.3 atmospheres absolute, which is about 4.2 PSI. Hard chambers can also operate at 1.3, but it's assumed that a hard chamber is going to operate at 1.3 or higher. And many people are using hard chambers at 1.5 to 2.0 or even greater. And so this debate is really about pressure. Can we get impact at 1.3 atmospheres or do we need two atmospheres or more in order to have therapeutic value. One of the reasons that this is important is because lower pressure chambers are more easily accessible. Whether that's because having a mild hyperbaric chamber set up in your home is more convenient and more accessible today than ever, or even inside of clinics, there are far more clinics that are adding mild hyperbarics into that clinical setting than hard chambers currently. And so if you have access to a mild system, are you going to get the results that you're looking for? Or do you need a hard chamber? Or in other words, do you need higher pressure in order to get the impact that you're looking for? And so in my 20 years in the industry, we've used all of the above. We've used soft chambers. We've used hard chambers at mild pressures and higher pressures. And I had some assumptions, and we've even done previous videos on a similar topic, talking about the differences between mild hyperbarics and higher pressure hyperbarics. My assumptions and what I've seen clinically is we can use soft chambers and get similar results in many cases to hard chambers. And sometimes that had to do with time and frequency. In other words, if I do more frequency, longer sessions over longer periods of time, I can have similar impacts that I might have at higher pressures in a shorter period of time. There are studies at lower pressure looking at what impact lower pressure has, and there's far more studies on higher pressure and the impact that high pressure has. And there really have never been comparison studies looking at both and understanding within the same protocol what are soft chambers or mild pressures doing and what are hard chambers or higher pressures doing inside that same program. As you can imagine, through this channel, but also through all of the courses that I've taught, this is one of the most frequently asked questions. And so when I went back for my PhD, the research I chose to do was a head-to-head -head comparison study, looking at lower pressure, looking at higher pressure, building a specific protocol, and putting everybody through that program so we can see exactly what's happening at different time frames in the exact same protocol at two different pressures. Within some of the parameters, we found a lot of overlap. In other words, 
lower pressure and higher pressure both lowered systemic inflammation and did so similarly. Both mild pressures and higher pressures improved memory and cognitive performance. Both lower pressures and higher pressures had impact on reversing biological age. Both mild pressures and higher pressures impacted epigenetic signaling. And so in many ways, at a surface level, both mild and high pressure impacted very similar categories of physiological change. At the same time, if we dive a little bit deeper into each one of those categories, there were some major differences. Both pressures lowered inflammation, but on very specific cytokine numbers, high pressure had an impact that lower pressure wasn't capable of. At the same time, on a different set of cytokines, lower pressure had an impact that higher pressure wasn't capable of. And now that needs to open up a conversation. Well, either one's going to lower inflammation systemically, but if we knew which cytokine we were looking for, we may now choose a protocol and a pressure based on which cytokine we're trying to have the most impact on. Both mild pressure and high pressure impacted cognitive performance and memory, but higher pressure appeared to do that faster. Lower pressure appeared to do it a little slower, but lower pressure also seemed to have a longer impact after the treatments were over, whereas higher pressure, the impact started to fade over time. When I launched my hyperbaric clinic in 2005, there was no roadmap. I had to learn the hard way, how to run chambers safely, how to keep patients comfortable, and how to stay compliant. That's why I created the Basic Hyperbaric Technician Certification Program. I wish that I had access to this course when I first opened my clinic. In just 12 hours of training, you'll understand the science, the safety, the protocols that every operator needs to know. If you're serious about getting into hyperbaric oxygen therapy, start here and enroll today. In the biological aging category, both pressures had a reversal on biological age, but depending on which biological age clock we were looking at, Lower pressure had more impact on certain biological aging clocks. Higher pressure had an impact on different biological aging clocks. Similarly, on the epigenetics, both had massive impact on epigenetic signaling, but the low pressure impact was completely different from the high pressure impact. What does this mean? It speaks to one of the things that I bring up on many of the videos. Which hyperbaric is best for me? It depends on what your goals are, what you're trying to accomplish. What health challenges do you have? And what are you trying to get from the therapies that you're about to embark on? And quite honestly, once you get through whatever initial programming you need from hyperbarics, my opinion is our approach to hyperbaric should probably look a lot more like our approach to exercise. There's not a single one type of exercise that's the best exercise for all humans. In fact, exercise variation is one of the most important things we can create in a long-term exercise program. Similar to diet, there's not one single diet that every human should follow day in and day out for the rest of their life in order to achieve ultimate and optimal health. Diet variation is the key to long-term health with regard to our diet. Well, in my opinion, hyperbaric variation is also what we need. We should be varying the frequency, varying the duration, varying the pressure exposures, and varying the oxygen exposures, and creating a multitude of variation with regard to our hyperbaric exposures to extract the most out of our hyperbaric programming. Now that we see some of the differences between the two, we could start to say, well, here's your biggest issue, or here's your biggest goal. Therefore, your initial protocol should look more like this. Lower pressure is more important for you higher pressure is more important for you. And as we solve those issues or reach those goals, we move into a hyperbaric variation program to elicit all of the different impacts that different pressures will have on our physiology. So back to the extreme stances on this conversation. Soft chambers don't do anything or soft chambers do everything that hard chambers can do. One, recognize it's not a material issue, it's a pressure conversation soft chambers operating at more mild pressures, hard chambers capable of operating at higher pressures. And like most other debates or conversations out there, neither extreme is right. The answer is somewhere in the middle. They all have value. They certainly all have massive impact. But depending on your goals and your issues and what we're solving for, 
one may be a better fit than the other. So depending on what you have access to may determine which one you start to use or working with somebody that might be able to assess or test certain factors or markers that may drive a decision of which one is better to start with. Also using this concept of variation to get the most out of whatever you have access to. If you have a soft chamber that operates at a specific pressure, you can still go lower than that pressure. You could also change your frequency and duration exposures. You could also change your oxygen exposures. So even inside a singular soft chamber, you can still create changes and variation with regard to what amount and type of exposure you're getting. In a hard chamber, there's certainly more variety to create a larger variety of treatment options and variations from pressure to frequency and duration and oxygen exposures. There also may be an opportunity where you're doing a number of your sessions in a mild chamber at home, but you're looking to a relatively local clinic for periodic exposures to higher pressure as a way to get some of that variation somewhere because you can't get it at home. There's a lot of ways to put this together. And quite honestly, we're learning more every day about how to build more and appropriate protocols around health issues and health goals. That's what this channel is about. I'm always trying to deliver the latest in what we know so that I can share this with you and get the most recent information out there into the world. Now, I mentioned some of the details of the study that I did last year. So if you want more information, more detail about that study that we finished, you can click on this playlist here and it'll take you to the series of those videos that we did on that research. Go ahead, click it. Thanks for your time and attention. We'll see you the next time.